Hello, today's lecture is going to be a continuation of the last lecture. Last lecture we looked at classical conditioning. Uh, in this lecture we're going to focus on operant conditioning, which is essentially uh, what follows classical conditioning. So remember, classical conditioning was stimulus to stimulus learning, basically learning the association between two events. So this lecture instead is going to focus on the uh, outcome of events and how that outcome can impact uh, the, the recurrence of a given behavior. So operant conditioning is essentially uh, what's known as operant behavior. So we have two types of behavior. Respondent behavior, which is the normal behavior that occurs as a result of exposure to a stimulus. So, um, you know, when you're presented with food, you salivate. That is a respondent behavior. Uh, operant conditioning, on the other hand, involves an operant behavior. So an operant behavior is one that operates on the environment, which generates some sort of a reward or punishment. And that reward or punishment then makes it more or less likely for that behavior to recur. So operant behavior is a little bit more complex than your standard respondent behavior. So the first way that we began sort of looking at operant conditioning really actually goes before some of the classical conditioning work, um, but a lot of it came significantly later. So one of the earliest things that people have kind of realized is rewarded behavior will recur. So that's the earliest part of operant conditioning research, is just somebody saying, you know what, if you reward a behavior, it's going to happen again. Well, that statement got reiterated by a gentleman named Thorndike. So this is now known as Thorndike's Law of Effect, which is that rewarded behavior is likely to recur. So um, the way that Thorndike really examined this was uh, really kind of an interesting experiment that I'm sure the internet would be up in arms about. Cat in box. So basically what he did he, is he would take a cat and he would lock it in a box. And the cat would have to try to escape. That was his whole task, was just escape the box. And there were levers inside the box. Some of them did nothing. Some of them did something benign. And one of them would get you out of the box. And the cats had to learn how to exit the box. Uh, one of the really interesting things that, uh, that, that Thorndike observed and that others have observed since then is that they'll actually display the exact same behavior to get out of the box even if it's in unnecessary behavior. So let's say that you have uh, the, the lever to open the box in the middle of the floor. And all the cat needs to do is move it two inches. And the way that they happen to do this one time is that they happen to rub on it with their left shoulder. Okay? From there on out, they will perform the exact same behavior and use the left shoulder. Even if they could use the right, they're still learning the association between left shoulder hits this lever and I get the hell out of this box. Uh, so that's the earliest chamber uh, or the earliest uh, experiments with operant conditioning. After that we move over to a guy named Skinner and he actually took this uh, in a different direction by using a different animal but the idea was still largely the same. He used a, a box with mice or rats. Did both. Um, but the idea here with the Skinner box, that's what we call his devices, isn't to escape, it's actually to get food. So the way that they do this is they press a lever and they get food. Pretty simple. Um, so, so that's the operant chamber. Uh, it's, it's basically, uh, it's going to be like connected to some sort of external device that counts the number of times and how long it takes. So, I mean, we do get more metrics off of it. It's not just training a rat to press a lever. We actually pull some metrics from it, and it gives us an examination of how the learning is occurring. And one of the things that they found is that the learning occurs uh, best through what's known as shaping. So, shaping the behavior of an individual in such a way that they do that behavior more. And the best way to do this is through what's known as successive approximations. So, uh, you know, if you've got a really stubborn animal that doesn't learn well, 
uh, and, and you want to teach them to sit. Well, you know, you say the command, and when they even start moving like they're about to sit down, you reward that behavior. And then you wait until they have to sit a little bit closer to the ground, and then you reward that behavior. And then finally, they sit all the way down, and you reward that behavior. So you go through in little steps, and you reward the bits and pieces that make it happen. Uh, and, and so this is really how operant conditioning begins, is by these small steps that are gradually rewarded. So uh, the, the practical applications of this, uh, you know, my mom's a search and, dog, uh, search and rescue uh, dog handler, and she uses successive approximations to teach her dogs how to identify uh, human remains scent. And, uh, you know, this, this little, um, well, he's not so little when you think about what he is. He's actually a giant pouched rat. Um, this rat right here sniffs out mines. And the way that they train the rat is through using successive approximations. Uh, this manatee over there doesn't have any um, job, so to speak, but it learns how to discriminate objects through successive approximation. We do this with ourselves, too, though. I mean, this is not something that's just a fun way to train animals how to, to do fancy tricks. We actually perform best under successive approximations as well. Uh, in fact, one of the, uh, you know, the, the, the things that's really interesting that you have to be cautious of is, uh, you know, rewarding uh, behavior when it becomes annoying. Uh, so, so you don't reward the lower levels of behaviors when someone, like, asks you to do something. But then when someone finally becomes annoying, uh, you know, then you do whatever you need to do to help them out. Well, what they've done is, using successive approximations, they've, uh, you know, sort of changed the way that you respond to their behaviors, and you reward it. So, it's a little, little dangerous. But um, successive approximations are the best way to teach someone how to do something, rewarding the low-level steps until they come to the final, accurate display of the behavior. So we have different types of reinforcers, uh, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about what positive and negative mean in psychology. So, you know, I mean, when you generally hear the words positive and negative, you think good and bad. That's not what we're talking about here. When we say in psychology that something is positive, what we mean is that something has been added. When we say that something is negative, we mean that something has been taken away. So there are two types of reinforcers, ones that are positive, which means adding something that someone wants. So if I were to reward my cat's behavior with a treat, that would be positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is removing an aversive stimuli. So for example, this might be uh, something where your car stops beeping at you when you fasten your seat belt. So it encourages that behavior by giving you something that you really don't want until you do the behavior at which point that goes away. We also have two different levels of reinforcement. We have those that are primary reinforcers. These are the reinforcers that uh, are, are the ones that are ingrained. They're, they're things that you don't even have to think about wanting. So these are things like hunger and thirst and sexual motivation. These are things that you just want and nothing, those are the things that you need to survive and you also want to, to make your life a little bit better. Um, or at least rather generate more of your species. So I'm not talking about like TV, that's not a primary reinforcer. Um, but, but things that are innately reinforced. The conditioned reinforcers, on the other hand, are the uh, second level. They're secondary reinforcers. And the secondary reinforcers are learned reinforcers. They get their power through the association with the primary reinforcer. So this is essentially money. Money is what's known as a secondary reinforcer because it gives you access to some of the primary reinforcers that you want. There are plenty of other conditioned or secondary reinforcers, but that's a prime example because money gets you access to food and water. Now, in addition to the different types of reinforcers, 
there's also another way of looking at reinforcers, which is how often they occur and how close after an event they occur. So an immediate reinforcer is one that happens closely to that behavior in time. So, uh, you know, you press the bar and you get a pellet of food. That's an immediate reinforcer. A delayed reinforcer is one which is delayed for a certain amount of time, uh, and, and that's for a certain behavior. So an example is a paycheck. Uh, now, one of the things that's really interesting is that we are, of course, more inclined to engage in the small immediate reinforcers, like watching television, than the delayed reinforcers. Um, and part of the reason for this is because until pretty much our species and a few other species that have developed this behavior as well, uh, there were no real delayed reinforcers. It was all an immediate reinforcer. If it wasn't immediate, then it didn't, it didn't reinforce the behavior. But we have, uh, because of our larger frontal lobe, we have more free association area to understand and think about things. And so we understand that work now provides a reward later. So um, one of the things that you have to look out for is the desire to have an immediate reinforcer. So many people will put off what they need to get done later. Um, they'll put that off till later instead of taking care of it now because the reward is it now. So um, that's pretty much how procrastination is born. And then, you know, it becomes immediate and you get stressed out and it's terrible. Uh, so, so do your best to, to try and accept the fact that some rewards will be delayed. And that's not a bad thing. Now, um, I mentioned just a second ago that not only can uh, the timing of the reward or the reinforcement uh, impact your uh, likelihood of displaying a behavior, but there's also schedules of reinforcement that can impact the likelihood of the recurrence of a behavior. So, uh, you know, the, the first one that we think of is continuous reinforcement. You know, that rat presses the bar and it gets the pellet of food and it eats the food and then it wants more so it presses the bargain it gets the pellet of food. Well, this is what's known as continuous reinforcement. You get reinforced every time the behavior occurs. Partial reinforcement is only reinforcing the behavior some of the time. So you would think that, that continuous reinforcement is the, is the way to go. You know, consistency wins, right? Well, when it comes to reinforcement, we, we see that that's not actually the case. And it makes sense if you think about it. So um, a partial reinforcement schedule results in a slower acquisition of the behavior. Um, but because of that slower acquisition, it's more resistant to extinction later on. So if you remember last lecture, we spoke about extinction, which is, of course, when a behavior no longer occurs, when the original um, stimulus, you know, we've got the conditioned stimulus, uh, it no longer elicits the conditioned response because they've lost their association. So that's the extinction. Well, if you don't know when you're going to get rewarded, then it's going to be harder to extinguish that behavior because you're just thinking, oh, well, I just haven't gotten rewarded yet. But if you have something that never breaks down, you always get rewarded. Well, if you don't get rewarded, then yeah, you're going to learn pretty quick. Oh, well, the system's broken. You know, so if you have, uh, I don't know, you go to um, the snack machine. And you put in a dollar, and you know you press the button for the M and M's, and you get, uh, you know, you get ready to get your M and M's, but nothing drops. It ate your dollar. Well, you could put in another dollar, and it does it again. You're you're gonna stop putting in a dollar because that reinforcement go has gone away for you. You you know that something is broken, something's gone wrong. But with the partial reinforcement, you never know when the re reinforcement is going to occur. And so you're just kind of like, oh, well, I'm just sitting around waiting to be reinforced for my behavior. Um, so if you use this partial reinforcement schedule, you can either use a ratio schedule or an interval schedule. And within each of those, there's two levels. 
So uh, let's, let's look at ratio schedules first. So a ratio schedule can either be fixed ratio or variable ratio. And so a fixed ratio schedule is one which reinforces the behavior after X number of behaviors. So uh, if you want to give a bird a pellet of food after pressing a lever 17 times, that's a fixed ratio schedule. A variable ratio schedule, on the other hand, reinforces after an unpredictable number of responses. So, because of this variable ratio schedule, you might get food after three bar presses, or you might get food after 33 bar presses. So, this is, again, even harder to extinguish because it's so unpredictable. This is a behavior that you don't ever know when you're going to be reinforced. And so you just keep doing the behavior waiting to be reinforced. So gambling is a perfect example. You know, you, you sit down in the machine, you pull the lever, and you don't win. And you don't win. And you don't win. But then you do win. And then you don't win. And it keeps going. But you're always waiting for that win because of the way that a variable ratio schedule operates. This is also why some gentlemen might not learn that their pickup lines are ridiculous because it just so happens to work one out of every 45 women. And so they're reinforcing this behavior because it's so variable. Now let's look at interval schedules. So like ratio, they can be either fixed or variable. So a fixed interval schedule reinforces the response after a specific amount of time has passed. So, you know, if, if I gave tests, you guys would start studying before the test. You wouldn't study all the time, you would study in like the week before the test. Variable interval schedule, on the other hand, reinforces the response at times that you might not be able to predict. So, this is like a pop quiz. So the, um, one of the things that I, I learned quite quickly while, while teaching uh, at the university that I was going to grad school at was that if I wanted my students to study, the best way to make them study was to tell them that they were going to have a surprise pop quiz ten times through the semester, and I would never tell them when it was. They could expect no pop quizzes for a month and then have one all of a sudden, have uh, three in one week, you know, unpredictable. And what I found was that when I did that versus when I told them these are the days and, and such of the, the pop quiz or the quiz schedule, variable interval got them to study more. Sure, they might not have liked it, but it increased that steady responding because they never knew when they were going to be reinforced for that behavior. And getting an A on a quiz is a good reinforcement for a behavior. So let's look at how it might, how long it might take for these behaviors to become acquired based on these different schedules. So this is a graph of, of partial reinforcement schedules. And the first thing that you should notice right off the bat, and this is, okay, so we've got the number of responses and time in minutes for those responses to occur. So what you can see is that the variable interval is the slowest, right? It's steady, but it's slow. And the fixed ratio, that's the quickest learning, right? Um, you know, they get more responses uh, in a shorter amount of time. But what we see is that in the fixed schedules, so the fixed ratio and the fixed interval, what we get is a sort of jagged growth where it's it's dependent upon these reinforcements but the variable schedules as you'll notice are more steady so because of the nature of the um, you know the the inconsistent awards the behavior becomes more consistent in the desire of obtaining those rewards so these are the two best schedules for learning, the ones that are variable. Now, we've talked a lot about reinforcement. 
Let's look at the other side of the coin, which is punishment. So punishment is an aversive event that decreases the likelihood that a behavior will recur. Uh, now, like I said before, we're talking about positive as in additive and negative as in taking away. So positive punishment means administering an aversive stimuli, which means something like spanking or uh, you know giving someone a uh, you know a bad grade. A negative punishment, on the other hand, is taking away something that you desire. So uh, taking away your freedom and saying that you're grounded. Uh, you know, taking away your car privileges. These are things that are negative punishments. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that some of these punishments are um, possible to belong on both sides of the coin. So you always have to be very careful, and you can actually argue that some punishments can be both positive and negative. And a perfect example might be a grade. So it's a positive punishment uh, if it's a bad grade. Clearly, I mean, it's, it's a reinforcement if it's a good grade. But let's say that it's a, uh, you, you got an F. Well, that can be a positive punishment because it's giving you the aversive stimuli of a bad grade. But it's also, it could also be argued as negative punishment because it's withdrawing the, the desirable status of being a good grade student. So um, I'm just letting you know you can argue punishments in either direction, but know that if you argue it in either direction that you should be able to identify what is being added and what is being subtracted. Now, one of the things that uh, is really interesting about punishment is that it doesn't do a very good job of shaping behavior. Well, it does in one way. It does in a number of ways, but not in the way that you might want. So punishment has some, some drawbacks. It results in fears, unwanted fears in, in children and, and even in adults. Uh, it doesn't give uh, the organism any information about, you know, how to improve. It also justifies pain to others and suggests that, that pain is, is an acceptable, uh, you know, hurting somebody is an acceptable way to deal with a frustrating situation. Um, number four is quite possibly the biggest reason why punishment doesn't work, which is that unwanted behaviors reappear in its absence. If you have a parent that spanks their child for everything that they do wrong, that doesn't mean they're going to stop doing the behaviors when you're not there. They're just going to stop doing it when you're not around. They're going to do it all the time when you're not around. Um, in addition, they're not going to like you very much. There's going to be some aggression towards the agent. And then lastly, uh, unwanted behaviors may appear in, in place of the other. So punishment is really not the best way to shape the behavior of another. Um, it just... It just doesn't work. It just leads to too many negative consequences. Now, sometimes punishment is necessary. Don't get me wrong. I do agree that punishment is occasionally necessary. Uh, but physical punishment only teaches an individual to not do the behavior while they're being watched. It also teaches them that they don't internalize the rules of why they're doing it. So if I stop, I don't know, um... Nah, that's a bad behavior. When I was a little kid, uh, my grandma used to drive her nuts. I used to stick my toes underneath her carpeting. I, it's, it's weird, I know. But she had a cool floor. It was a, you know, it was a tile floor. And so there was a rug, and I would stick my toes under it, and it felt nice. But she hated it. She hated that I did it. Well, she would punish me, and I would just do it when she wasn't around. I didn't learn anything from it. Because my, in my mind, the only reason that I didn't do that was because I was going to get punished. If, on the other hand, you teach your child why they shouldn't engage in a behavior, and you get them to possibly even feel bad about being involved in the behavior, well, then they begin to internalize that. And then instead of me saying, oh, I'm going to stick my toes under the rug as soon as she leaves the room, I would say to myself something quite different, something more along the lines of, I shouldn't be doing this because it messes up the rug. It stretches it, and it also makes it look less appealing. There we go. I learned something. So punishment is not always the way to go, but it does have practical applications at times.
Now we're, we're coming to a close here. Um, the only, only three more slides. But I did want to talk a little bit about the thought processes behind some of the conditioning. So last lecture, you know, I, I talked about how associative learning does have a cognitive component. Well, so does operant conditioning. Um, and in fact, what we do oftentimes is uh, we develop a mental representation of what's going on around us without thinking about it and without having a practical application for it yet. So, um, for example, the, uh, they did studies where they would put rats in a, uh, a cage. And this, this cage had a maze. And the maze had no reward. There was no point. They just explored it. And they just learned about it. And they just had fun in it. You know, they just kind of walked around the maze. And what they did was they developed a cognitive map. These rats that were able to have this experience learned the map um, of the maze significantly better once they began being rewarded. So I'll show you more about that in a second, but I just wanted to say that certain mental maps may become valuable in the future. So in preparation for an unforeseeable future, we often learn what's going on. Uh, this, is, this is learning. I mean, this is also known as, as latent learning. So latent learning is uh, basically a style of learning that has no practical application at the time of learning. However, once a practical application presents itself, the learning becomes finalized much quicker. So if you look at this, this chart right here, we've got the blue line, which is when they always reinforce the behavior of the mouse or the rat. Uh, the, the green line is when they never reinforce the uh, behavior of the rat. And then, of course, the orange line is one where they begin reinforcing appropriate behavior after latent learning has begun. So they kind of travel along, they're learning, they're producing fewer errors as they go along, uh, much like the other two groups. However, we hit day 11, and they begin reinforcing the behavior, and bam, boy, do they learn, and they learn quickly, to the point where they ultimately make as few as two errors. So this is the result of latent learning. Now, latent learning is heavily impacted by motivation. So when one is motivated to succeed uh, for the benefit of themselves, just for the sake of doing it, this is known as intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is the desire to perform based on rewards or punishments. Now, intrinsic motivation is what's going to encourage a behavior to keep going. So this is why it may not actually be best if you have a child that exceeds um, expectations in school. They excel on their own and you don't ever reward them. Well, if you begin giving them money for their A's and B's, that becomes an extrinsic motivation. And they actually may not enjoy school as much anymore because they feel like they're just doing it for the reward. This is part of the problem with a grading schedule because it draws away from the intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation is when you, perhaps you have a, a child that really doesn't care about school. They're not interested in learning. Well, this might be a good child to sit down and say, hey, look, it's important that you learn. I know you're not interested in learning, but I'll give you $10 for every A. Well, that's going to motivate them to do well when they might not do well otherwise. So it really depends on how someone is motivated. And the motivation that they have might be dependent on the area. Like, for instance, um, you know, when I get asked to do a project at work that I have absolutely no interest in, yeah, I'm going to need some extrinsic motivation. Because, frankly, you know what? I don't want to spend extra time in my day doing something that I don't give a shit about. Extrinsic motivation. Give me something to make it worth my while. However, things like these lectures, something that I actually really enjoy, um, but I get no reward from other than your wonderful comments and your questions and, and the interaction with you guys. Other than that, I don't actually receive any sort of reinforcement aside from the sheer fact that I enjoy doing the behavior for its own sake. So this is something that I'm intrinsically motivated for. Uh, so that's basically it.
Um, you know, wanted to teach you guys a little bit about operant conditioning. This is how you're going to train your animals how to do various tricks and how to get them to fetch you a beer or whatever it is that you want to do. So if you're interested in training animals, learn about operant conditioning. Feel free to ask me any questions. I look forward to them, and I'll see you guys next time.